Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We are going to take a break for the month of July just because it's summertime. It's really hot, and I think a lot of people are busy and out doing other things, and we're struggling to get our guests to um, be available. That's actually one of the bigger issues. So not to worry, we will return, but when we return, we're going to have them nailed down and lined up so that we can just roll this thing out, and it'll be great. Uh, but today is one of my favorite guests. It's Daisy Vicking, and she's back for, I don't know, do we know what number webinar this is three. no it's more than three it's got to be four four myth before then got to yes. be four yeah yeah and she's got a really interesting topic today i'm going to let her talk about that and introduce herself but i am really curious about this analogy so welcome daisy thanks for joining me again thank you wendy i always <laughs> love coming on to your webinars we always have such a good time and who's your buddy who's your buddy this is, this is sergio he's a very fluffy dog with a very serious name <laughs> oh, Sergio, okay. yes, he wanted to hang out with us today. Oh, well, um, that's fine. Brad, Brad's yeah. texting me. Uh, Who's Brad said? Oh, it's just I'm I'm supposed to close on the warehouse tomorrow, and so now suddenly the checks are blowing up and everything's blowing up and trying trying to get everything organized in time for all of that to happen tomorrow. So, uh, um, anyway, <laughs> we're just going to turn it over to you and let you do your thing because I, um, I'm a little distracted. You have a lot going on. It's okay. No, it's okay. I I was really excited when you brought this topic up when I saw you in um, Massachusetts at oh, yeah. Alicia Harlow Clinic, and we were talking about um, water balloon analogy in relation to hoof care. And it's one of those things that if you come across it, it sticks with you. But if you've never heard it before, it's kind of like one of those things I find that makes like fireworks go off in your head, right? Like, oh, you know, I never thought about the hoof that way. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite topics. So, um, you know, when you were like, oh, this water balloon analogy, I'm like, yeah, let's talk about that on a webinar, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I have a presentation for us with some information. Yes, Sergio. Okay. I love I'm going to make you co-host. There you are. You are co-host. Great. You can share your screen. Okay. Share screen. All right. And we're going to do this one. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. Awesome. Great. Okay. So here we are. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, I am a farrier health care provider outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I specialize my work in hoof rehabilitation and whole horse um, integrative approach. So looking at things from the perspective of posture and load and all the wonderful things that Wendy, you've taught me over the last how many years. Um, it's so synergistic and it works really well together. And what I found is that one of the things that that in hoof care in particular, we actually have a lot of things we're taught that lead us down a path that isn't always accurate. So or maybe just doesn't serve the horse best. Right. So I have a question to start out, Wendy. OK. okay. Here's my question, just click over here. Okay, so how would you determine balance for horses like these? Um, wow. Well, you're gonna have to look at what's gonna make them the most comfortable. So comfort, sure. Um, what else? I, I don't know, there's so much going on in these guys that, you know, is basically, it's not confirmation because it looks like it's been long-term overuse arthritis injury. So you, you don't want to put more stress on those joints. So you've got to, oh, I don't know. This is like, you guys, come on, who are watching? You can help me. Yeah. <laughs> comment, comment in the chat. What do you think? How do you determine how to balance horses' feet with legs like this? I mean, this is a reality that as hoof care providers, we have to have a solution for this. And we're normally taught balancing to sole plane when we balance the foot. You know, you look down on the foot, you look at the sole, and you assess maybe um, how much height you have above the live sole, or look at the heel bulbs, or different things you might be taught. But it's usually bought based on sole plane. And unfortunately, when you have horses like this, sole plane does not cut it. Because if you trim these horses to have like a level coronary band and you trim them for equal wall length, side to side, things like that, 
these horses are not going to have a stable base of support. Right. You've really got to figure out. How, well, I don't know. I don't even know because these are kind of extreme. <laughs> these are extreme, but it proves the point that I yeah. wanted to start out with here, which is that we can't assess balance from something that's as linear as soul plane when we're talking about a whole horse. There's a lot more horse to consider, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay. That being said, let me ask one more question. Okay. How about this one? Oh dear. Which one of these feet is better balanced than the other? Now we're looking at soul plane. This is what we're taught to use is soul plane. Which I'm one wondering, has the well, the foot on the right, clear, clearly there's been a lot of compromise to that horse. So, you know, it goes back to the other picture that we just looked at without looking at the other picture. You can't, assist, it's like, I don't know how this horse is standing on this, like, to be quite frank. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, is that you're correct. However, both horses are balanced for what they need to have a healthy relationship with stability and gravity. And this horse on the right, it looks like there's a lot of bruising and all kinds of things that have been going on in that foot. Yeah, there's a lot of pathology there. And I can tell you that this horse um, was bitten by a snake, a poisonous snake, a venomous snake, and he necrosed. Um, can you see my, my cursor, yep. my mouse? Great. So he necrosed this heel bulb. And so not only did he have a lot of damage in this foot, he had a big infection here, but this part of his foot, the frog actually grew and moved over in order to um, give him something to stand on. Wow. Just adaptation by nature, right? So this foot is trimmed to balance what this horse needed for his body, for his stable support base, right? And so is the foot on the left, even though they, we have a visceral reaction of a foot we like versus a foot we don't like. Well, you know what? We're designed to seek symmetry uh, to for symmetry. I mean, that's the the thing I'm always teaching people is that they think they're balanced with symmetrical, and then I have them do the exercise with their arms, and they find out they're not. But we don't want to be asymmetrical. We like things symmetrical. Um, so yeah. those two, you know, the picture on the left is looking nice and symmetrical, and we're like, oh, that makes us feel good. And the picture on the right is like, oh, wait, asymmetrical, and so it doesn't make us feel as good. <laughs> exactly exactly so we have to boil it down to to me something that has a higher priority priority than just visual aesthetics right now so is this, this is, the the hoof on the right did we see that horse in the previous picture no oh, okay ironically this is a different this is a different horse okay. um but the the short answer of these horses is that um, you need to give these horses ease of range of motion in their joints with your trim. So you got to get out of the way what's in the way so that their joints don't have to articulate any more than necessary. And having them land flat is the most important thing. Even if the hoof capsule is twisted in some weird way, which of course it would be, yeah. um, they just need to be able to not fall down. Right. Right. And you know all about that of all people. Yeah. In fact, when I worked on these two horses, I sort of wish I'd had short foot pads because it would have been very informational to see how they loaded their feet to be able to find that place of stability. I think that would have actually shortcutted my uh, shortcut my uh, my investigative process for them. Right? It would have been good information. It would have. Um, neither of these horses is alive today, unfortunately. Um, but neither passed away from their legs. They are both, both older horses yes. and both had traumatic injuries. Yeah. So the, the mare on the left was unfortunately in a trailer accident where the trailer flipped mm. and she broke her neck, mm. her left knee and her right fetlock. And somehow she lived through it. I was going to say, the, wow. <laughs> right. And then the horse on the right as a two-year-old he had um, gotten a kite stuck in his tail in the field and gotten spooked and ran and ran and ran and fell into a ditch and broke his left knee, fractured some wow. of the bones in his knee and that healed up, but he had arthritis from it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, these are both extreme situations and yet both of these horses are over 
20 in these pictures. So they managed somehow, but some, somebody had to make a decision on what to do with their feet. Right. Right. Okay. So if soul plane isn't enough and we have to consider the horse above water balloon analogy is what really helps me conceptualize. How do I take into account all of the various individual anatomy and compensatory problems the horse might have in order to create something on the ground surface that the horse can stand on appropriately without undue stress or further compensation over time. Yeah. That's a mouthful. Yeah. So when, when I have a, um, somebody asks me, well, what's, what's your job as a farrier? What do you do as a farrier? I don't say balance the hoof, right? I say my job is to create a stable support base for each individual animal so they have the least amount of compensation and wear and tear over their lifespan. Yeah. That's my job. That's it. But yep. most people don't have that answer, right? I don't think. Well, a lot of people don't look up from the foot, right? Or, well, we're just taught when you pick up the foot, you, you assess balance this way and you might sight down the leg and you might do some other things, but we're not really taught to think of things from the top down and how the horse loads its feet. Right. So this is a diagram that I created that is more information about how to think about the balance of the foot and the limb. So if you imagine there's a foot here in the background, I think you can see it, and you're kind of looking at it from the inside heel bulb to the outside toe across. The crosshairs in the middle there, where it says COR, that is where the hoof capsule articulates around. So that is the center of rotation. And that's the middle of the um, short pastern. And it involves the coffin joint. So when you think about horses standing from the top down, the primary goal under normal circumstances to me for balance would be a neutrally loaded coffin joint when the horse is standing at rest, okay? So if you think about it from that direction, we need to consider more balance terminology and directions than just our typical you know, front to back, side to side, and top to bottom. So dorsal to palmar, medial to lateral, and distal to proximal. We need more than that, but that's traditionally how we're taught to think about balance in the hoof. Right. What we actually also need then is three-dimensional spatial reference for where is this limb at in space and how is it going to land on the ground? And that means we need to think about engineering terms like Yaw is toe in, toe out. Roll okay. is leaning to one side or the other. Roll this way. And then pitch is your heel height. Oh, okay. So if we take all that into account and you think of it like a swivel uh, foot on the end of one of those old school chairs we used to sit on in school, you know, where if the ground was, was uneven, it would accommodate because it would kind of pivot with us. That's the job of the coffin, the coffin joint. So if we balance around that, we're ahead of the game as a, as a starting point. Okay. With me so far? Yep. Okay. So all of this comes from, um, well, not all of this, but I first learned about these ideas from an amazing fairy named Mike Savoldi. And he is a retired farrier in California. And anytime you talk about the arch of the foot, um, he's the one that, uh, pioneered that idea. And this is some of his slides here that he generously has allowed me to use. Um, if you think about the graphic here, where the, where I've pictured some, some arches, if the center of the rotation of the hoof capsule, so that center point that we identified in the previous slide, if we put that at the middle of the arches, then you've got potentially a toe arc, a heel arc, a medial arc, and a lateral arc. So one kind of at each side that we think about in terms of balancing from the top down. So looking at this anatomy, this, this uh, picture at the bottom here is a dissection that he did based on the sole. 
And that's just the sole kind of carved out. And you can kind of see here the toe arch and the heel arch. And then this is the digital cushion at the back of the foot with the soul corium. That's the blood and nerves that nourish the soul and grow the soul. That sits on top of the soul body. And then the coffin bone sits on top of that. And the soul body and the bone sitting on it is what dictates the arches, the toe arch, heel arch, medial arch, lateral arch. Okay, and you can look at it from the top down as well over here, or here you have that soul body, that's the non-sensitive structure. So the inside of the frog here, the inside of the bars, and then the, the soul, and then the bone sitting on top of it. And over here, you've got the same thing, plus the digital cushion and then the corium beneath it. So all of this is what comprises those four arches, as he calls it, although um, I've been corrected in the past that it's actually four arcs and two arches, but right. suffice it to say, okay? So if we look at this another way, again, if you have the center of the, of the hoof and you have the toe arch and the heel arch on the sole body here, then, oops, sorry, then this is how the bone would sort of sit on top of that. Now, obviously this bone did not go in this sole. But you can get the idea that there is support here, like our own feet, right? Under, under P3, under the coffin bone, that supports this entire structure. And yet this bottom surface is what we work on as hoof care providers. It, it's interesting because it, the analogy between our arches and our feet and these arches, that's kind of fascinating, actually. Yes. And it, it's so relative, but it's also completely different because right, the relative exactly. anatomy is so different. And yet we experience problems with arches, plantar fasciitis or, you know, fallen arches. You know, I have custom insoles in my shoes because I believe it or not, I have high, low feet. So I've got a club foot that's a half size smaller that has a high arch. And I have a flat platter foot that has a low arch that's a half size bigger. And I know that because the running store that I go to oh, did a yeah. scan of my feet. And I was like, I'm a high low horse. <laughs> you know? So when I look at the custom insoles, one has a higher arch to it and one has a lower arch. And then I just have to decide what size shoe is more comfortable between my two feet, right? But, but the dynamic is, is very similar. So this would be then the medial arch and the lateral arch. And again, with the bones sitting on top, and this gap here would be the, the corium, that blood and nerves that nourishes the soul um, would be between that. But you can see how this bone sitting on top of that soul body is very structural in nature. Okay. Yep. So this is where water balloon analogy becomes really helpful because that idea of the soul body and the arches and the anatomy is a lot for most people to wrap their brains around. But if you think about this, where this is that is this is that center of rotation, same rotational center of the hoof capsule, and in a straightish horse, and you're talking about building a foundation for a house, and it has to be straight, you know, no leaning tower of pizzas here. If the load were coming straight down from the horse through the limb, then the water balloon would be evenly loaded under the bone, which is like the sole and the arches. Okay. On the other hand, when we get some of these kind of asymmetries of the limb, and then let alone the compensatory factor of whatever else the horse is happening to be dealing with in its life, you have an asymmetry of load. And then the load comes down, not through the center, but maybe displaces some of the water balloon to one side or the other, in this case, looking at the front of the hoof. So if this is the coffin bone, and then this is like the, the plane of the bone is actually tilted because the, the load is coming through the inside. This would be a right front foot. This would be the outside. This would be the inside. And then that load is pushing the volume over to the outside. So there's more mass out there. Isn't that cool? That's very cool. It's a really great, great, great way to think about from a 
easy reference. We all know what happens when we hold a water balloon and you push one side or you push the other side or you sit it on the table or it falls off the table yeah. and you watch it form as it rolls, right? We all know what that does. So it's a familiar reference to think about how those arches actually support the coffin dog. So, so basically when the load isn't coming down through the middle, you're getting a distortion in your arches bulging, bulging the water balloon over in some places and squishing it in others. Right. Because the water balloon to me represents the blood flow. Okay. Okay. So if you think about the same amount of blood volume is going into the foot, regardless of how it's loaded. So for example, on this horse, where he's overly loading the inside of his foot, not only is the water balloon biomechanically being displaced to the outside, but some of the blood flow that would be available to the inside of this foot is actually flowing to the outside. Because so of the pressure. Yeah. Right. So therefore this side grows faster and this side either atrophies or grows slower, which is why this bone, and I know I've drawn it in this outline, but I can tell you this is the bone that goes in this foot. This bone is actually shorter on the inside than the outside. And I can tell you he wasn't born that way. That happened due to lack of nourishment over time. His bone actually modeled to make this a flat spot, even though it would have had all this bone over here. So, so this would, this had been going on for a long time for this particular horse. He was only six. Oh, so because of, he was this huge thoroughbred. And if we have time, I can show you his whole case study. Um, but he, he had been overloading this from when he was born, you know, he was born with this confirmation of an offset capsule and being long and leggy. And he was 18 hands and, oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah, huge thoroughbred and without a strong foot. And so he just kind of started damaging his foot probably from the moment his feet touched the ground. Yeah. You know? And so of course the, the another way to look at it is the foot on the left here is um, a horse that I own who's very straight in his anatomy and his hoof capsule is very symmetrical all the way around. So his water balloon is probably just perfectly loaded, right? Everything grows in symmetry compared to this horse with his asymmetry of anatomy and how his hoof has distorted from that point. Yeah, can, you can see it's affected the collateral ligaments. Uh, 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 blah, blah. I wanna put my pointer over here and- uh, uh, One? That, yes. Thank you, yes. So this is the this is the lateral cartilage, Thank right? You. That's what I was trying to yeah. say. <laughs> it's okay. So, you know, yeah, he has this huge side bone, and he actually would land quite hard on the outside of his foot and roll in, which probably had something to do with this side bone because this was functionally longer on this side compared to this side. So, not only did he have this asymmetry of load. But then he was one of those that when you watched him walk towards you, he would land outside clunk, outside clunk, outside clunk. So we did a whole bunch of stuff to help him get this hoof capsule more centered under load and conceivably load the arches or the water balloon as evenly as possible. And what, his, what he did in response was incredible, what his foot changed to. So, you know, that's a whole nother case study. If we have time, we can look at that. But yeah, I, and so, yeah. so more to talk about. Was this horse always barefoot? So when I met this horse, he was actively laminitic and his hoof capsule, this is actually a picture of his rehabilitated foot. His hoof capsule was so short that the farrier couldn't keep shoes on because he couldn't grab into enough wall. And he was this rambunctious 60 year old who would run around and carry on and throw his shoes so the farrier actually called me in because he's like, you need a glue on shoe. Like we can't nail on this horse anymore. And he was so sore. And so um, we were able to do some really fun things for him. So what I know of his past was he was never raced. He was a hunter jumper horse who washed out of jumping. We can certainly understand why. We can understand that one, yes. <laughs> yep. 
And so, um, so he was given away to a home that wanted to use him for pleasure riding, hacking out, maybe popping over a, a log here and there. And um, they could not get him sound. Is this his and right so, front or his left front? Right front. So this side is lateral and this side is medial. So, yeah, well, I mean, because one of my thoughts is wouldn't the horse wear that outside down if he was throwing his shoes off and basically barefoot? Wouldn't, wouldn't if there was that much concussion on that side, wouldn't he wear that down? But clearly he didn't. I think it's because he had so much blood supply on that side. And then the think of it like the, the inside was actually being the crost. So he had chronic bruising. He had like, you know, wall separations on that side. Um, and he was constantly beating the inside up. And so the outside was just growing enough that he never got ahead of it. Got it. Yeah, interesting, because you would think if he's landing hard out there, but then he wasn't also on an abrasive surface, you know, he was out in grass pasture. Right, right. Maybe it would have been different if he had been on something abrasive, but he had no foot when we started. I mean, literally this humongous thoroughbred and he went into a shoe that was like, Ooh, yeah, a little shoe. Yeah, tiny feet. So yeah, interesting case study. Um, so, you know, again, just kind of looking at, where the masses are and where the load is, you know, just a couple different ways to look at that shape of the bone, the whole nine yards. It also works, of course, from a lateral perspective. So again, this is that same horse that's super good footed, really symmetrical, and he's got a great coffin bone. And I, you know, I draw these based on their radiographs. So this isn't just me imagining a bone in the foot or doing something in a stylized depiction. This is actually where I take the radiograph everything has scale markers, overlay them on top of each other and trace out the exact shape and position of that animal's specific bone. Okay, so right. in this case, you know, here's the center, load comes down, the leg is fairly straight, um, that this arch here at the bottom is evenly loaded. So we have a positive palmar angle in relation to the ground here of the bottom of the bone. The dorsal aspect is parallel to the dorsal aspect and we have a healthy back of the foot. This foot over here is a, an example of a club foot. It's a well-managed club foot because there's not a lot of distortion in the foot, but in this case, the toe arch is collapsed. So let's see, all right. So that, that note there is not correct, actually. Will not press me leave what? No. So this is where the horse is collapsing the toe arch or compressing that water balloon in the toe and therefore the bone here suffers. So he's worn a flat spot here and the heel arch is overdeveloped, but same dynamic, more blood supply is going to the back, more volume of water of the water balloon. And so more heel is growing than toe. So interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, whether you call them arches or you think about it as a water balloon, it's all the same dynamic, but I think it does help with the, with the liquid analogy to think about it from the perspective of the same amount of blood volume going into the foot and where is it going? What is being nourished? What's receiving oxygen and nutrients? Where is uh, blood flow not adequately perfusing? So there's waste material there. There's die off of cells that just sits there, you know, chronically and it, and it stagnates and suffers. Well, and right? looking at that, your, this foot that you say is a club foot. If I just look at the foot itself, it doesn't look that clubby. Obviously the coffin bone drawn in makes it look very clubby, but the, yeah. I, so, <clears throat> is that just me? Well, no. Um, so everybody defines a club foot a little differently, unfortunately. To me, a club foot has very, very specific structural parameters. And some of this comes from ELPO because they're very good at, at defining everything, Equine Lameness Prevention Organization, um, where when you look at a club foot, if you look at the solar surface, it's gonna have very straight bars, very straight quarters, heels that come back and then curve abruptly it's usually going to have some kind of defect at the toe of the white line and flattening of the sole in front of the frog apex. Not always, but usually. 
So before I was working on this foot, this foot was severely distorted, had a had a almost parallel uh, coronary band angle to the ground, so very high heel, a big twist to it, and a huge dish on the dorsal wall. But a well-managed club foot should look like an upright normal foot. It shouldn't look like it's got an obscene amount of pathology. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, this is where it goes back to looking from the top down. And Wendy, I know you and I have talked about this a lot and Surefoot really helps us with um, helping horses find their place of stability, right? Yep. So the horse on the left is actually the one that I showed you with the offset capsule and the big thoroughbred with the little feet that we just looked at. That's him. Oh, and wow. That's how, okay. Yeah. And that's how he stood um, when I met him. It was, it was, re he was so sore on those front feet and he was just compensating with the hind end like mad versus the horse on the right that was diagnosed as a navicular horse and had kind of low heels, but stood square and was very sound. He was very functional standing that way. So if we can get the horse to load those arches appropriately, they can grow their foot in as non-distorted a way as possible, giving themselves the best opportunity to avoid injury and breakdown from compensation over time. You know, the horse on the right is, you know, 23 years old there. The horse on the left is six years old. Oof. And the difference to me is how they loaded their feet and how they stood. So someone's asking, uh, and I think it's in reference to the previous picture, previous slide, whether the horse needs frequent chims forever to maintain that. No, no, because once you get the, the circulation more evenly loaded in the foot, you have a, um, you have, it will grow more symmetrically. Now it will always tend towards being clubby. So yes, you're gonna might take a little more heel. You might remove a little dish at the toe, but um, it's not gonna be nearly as distorted. So horses like this for me are on a four to six week cycle, depending on the time of year. Faster in the summer, shorter cycle, slower in the winter, longer cycle. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. So it's the it's the horse's inherent anatomy, the shape of their coffin bone, plus the weight of the horse on their feet. So gravity, right? How they're loading their feet, and then our trim choices that dictate how the foot deals with life over time. So like draft horses being so heavy, they platter out their feet because the horn tubules, whether it's a pony or a draft horse, the, the physical structure of a horn tubule is only as strong as the physical structure of a horn tubule. It doesn't matter how thick it is, mm. right? So that's like why elephants only do a running walk. They never have more than one foot off the ground at one time. Yeah, they're gated. <laughs> right, right. Because they, like an elephant stampede, they're all walking really, really, really fast, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, because their bones, even though their bones are massive in size, a bone cell still has the physical properties of a bone cell. So the bigger the animal, the straighter the legs to hold himself up and the less they're going to pick legs up, you know, um, off the ground higher or more than one at a time because the bones just can't handle it. Unless you're a giraffe. Unless you're a giraffe, but then you have two bones. And then you often fracture them anyway. So, yes, but you have really long legs, so it's easy to light, lightweight, long legs, as opposed to elephant, big, heavy legs. <laughs> yes. And they also use their head and neck to help themselves along, right? Oh, so, hugely. Yeah. And they don't really lift their legs up off the ground that high, do they? I mean, if they're um, playing, they gallop. They, come, they gallop, but do they yeah. come up as high yeah. or more forward? Uh, um, I can show you some, I'll show you some, some. Uh, cantering giraffes. They do pick up their legs and because they have to throw them out there. <laughs> yeah, right. They've got all that long length. Yeah. Yes. But then yes. they're, when you look at the relative uh, diameter of their legs, it's they're very thin. So that's not like they're trying to move a big heavy leg. Yeah. Right. 
right? Where like ponies, little ponies, they have really boxy upright feet typically, right? And that's because their body mass just isn't enough to like drop those arches the same way. So they've got higher arches in their oh, okay. feet. Okay, yep. Okay, so it's the shape of the bone inherently. You know, some horses are just flat footed. Yep. Plus the weight of the horse on their own feet and how they load them. Do they stand under themselves? Are they, um, do they have offset capsules, which means the load is gonna be kind of wonky. And then how we trim the foot that affects what that foot looks like and how healthy those arches are, okay? So if you look at all the different hoof problems we have, where the water balloon analogy becomes really helpful is in thinking about where is the water balloon failing? And what can we do to reestablish even load of that water balloon. So for example, if you look at feet with different problems, different distortions, which is something you can address in your trim versus a pathology, which is a disease process, you can start to sort out where that balloon is failing, where that arch is being overloaded, and then work to build that part of the foot stronger or build up the structure of that even prosthetically, if you did it with say like a glue on composite shoe or something like that, where you can actually create fake foot until you can grow it. And based on, based on that water balloon, even loading of the water balloon. So I've broken down those, those types of feet into six categories. Okay, so the ideal foot is one that's gonna have evenly loaded water balloon. So all four arches are evenly loaded. That's a maintenance foot. You go in, you trim it, it's no big deal. Anything that's distorted on that foot, you can correct with a maintenance trim, okay? And then there's two different kinds of water balloons that are collapsing in the back of the foot. So the, the, the collapsed heel arch in the back. There's the low palmar angle in the front foot. So that's gonna be the water balloon collapse in the back on a front foot is gonna distort differently than the water balloon distorting in the back of the foot on a hind foot. Oh, okay. They distort differently. And so I broke those into two different types so that you can recognize what's going on, whether it's front or hind, but they have similar characteristics. Then you have the high palmar angle, which is the water balloon collapsing like the club foot in the front. And that's gonna be either a club foot or a chronically laminitic foot. <clears throat> and they are similar, but slightly different. And then the last one is where all four arches collapse, where you just have distal descent, the horse is flat, smashed the internal, support it needs, the water balloon is squished, flat, or maybe even popped completely. Yeah, and there are more horses like that than I think we ever expect. Type six feet are bad. So, <clears throat> so that water balloon analogy, think of it this way, it's helpful to then grasp what do you need to rebuild? So if you have a horse that has a low heel, and you're thinking about the water balloon and you're like, why is this horse always growing miles of toe and yet I can't grow any heel? Well, it's um, because that water balloon is shoved to the front and all that blood supply is going to the front and the back is atrophying. Does that help? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm a visual person. So I like to come in and do these um, kind of visual aids to help me. So if this is, you know, this is a foot and a radiograph that go together. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm like hoarse all of a sudden. Okay, take a drink. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so if you think of those arches as coming from two points in the toe and two points in the heel, and I've drawn that down here. So the yep. sole is like a square. And then you have the medial lateral arches and the dorsal and palmar arches. And in an ideal foot, they're evenly loaded, okay? Under the center, and this is the center here. 
Same with this diagram where you have these arches this way, this way. This is the center. Everything pivots around the center. And then you have this box that's, that's the heel points and then the toe points. And everything needs to pivot around that in an ideal foot. Easy peasy. When you have a back of the foot problem and that water balloon is being compressed in the back, everything is collapsing towards the back. So again, you've got that heel points and the toe points and the heel is collapsing back and everything is compressing in the back of the foot. The more of the blood supply is going to the front of the foot. And so you get an additional growth, additional volume in the front. Now, sometimes you can take that volume away and hopefully even out the water balloon a little bit, or sometimes you need to build it prosthetically or use a boot or something or so you therapy. know what this just reminded me of it reminded yeah. me of battles with air panels <laughs> yes because the problem that i see with a saddle like or let's just talk about a saddle pad for a moment a saddle pad with an air panel is that mm -hmm. the the when the rider gets on and loads it it pushes the air where there's less pressure but that creates a lever that keeps pushing the saddle into the direction that it's already going it doesn't level it out it actually right. makes it and that's exactly what this picture reminds me of is that with the balloon in the front getting bigger and bigger it's actually going to keep leveraging the the toe up and driving the heel down because that's where the volume is correct Got absolutely it. correct got it yeah so it's like the chicken and the egg it's like is the back on level or is the ground on level is is the saddle evenly placed but then what is the freaking rider doing right it's like the rider gets on there and it just that's the that's the weight of the limb coming down right and that's the that's the crap shoot so to speak Right. And, right. The, and the problem with something like what are air, like what are, you know, like I remember what are bids, okay, is that the, it's yeah. going to move away from the weight, not support the weight. And so then it actually just creates a bigger problem. Yep. I got it. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> so here's my diagram at the center and that heel arch collapsing. And then the other arches are overly full. Yep. Okay. This is front of the foot problems. Same thing. Club foot also had some laminitis, toe arch collapsing. Right. Four point, same here. So when you think about, <clears throat> when you think about front of the foot problems versus back of the foot problems, Front of the foot problems are gonna be laminitis, white line disease, toe cracks, um, club feet, things like that. Back of the foot problems are gonna be your navicular things. Um, it's gonna be arthritis, um, you know, ring bone, high and low, um, things like that. So depending on what part of the foot's collapsing, we have an associated pathology that goes along with that. Right. Okay. And then this is the type six foot where just everything is just smashed to the ground. The arches are not healthy at all. And then you have front of the foot uh, problems and back of the foot problems. So these are the feet I get called in to help a lot because there's not a lot you can do for these. They're like, they have flat tires. They have no spring and the whole foot is just inflamed and you have a whole combination of problems, which makes them hard to work on. Hmm. And of course our medial lateral, we have that too. So, you know, this of course is the straight leg and this is another example of an offset capsule with collapsing on the inside, collapsing that medial arch. So. You not only have this orientation, you have this orientation as well. Right, right. So pitch and roll. And then heaven forbid you have toe in, toe out and offset capsule. And now you're like, oh my gosh, how are we supposed to problem solve this as a farrier, right? Right. But most of us don't think about it from the direction of load and posture. 
load and pressure. And that's what I love about incorporating short foot pads into what we're doing is that I can make all these hoof capsules load in a neutral way. But what helps the horse reprogram into the new place? Right. And so you know, not only do we find that, that the pads are helpful for us, for horses that are, um, when we want to figure out what's going on, you know, sometimes it's like, what's their dominant, uh, habituated, uh, loading place in the moment we can use the pads and see, well, where do they go? You know, get them standing square on pads and see what they load. And it gives us valuable information. Sometimes they can't stand square and then putting wedges behind really helps, right? Get the heels up, get their cannon bones back. And they, and they think about it differently. And you see that parasympathetic process and that release of like, oh, I need to process this differently. Maybe I don't have to stand that dorky way I was standing for so long, right? Yeah. So we use them that way, but then we also use them in the physical therapy perspective of, okay, now we've neutralized as much with our approach to hoof care in evenly loaded arches, evenly loaded water balloon, equal perfusion of blood supply to help them grow a less distorted foot. But maybe they don't think they can stand like that. Right? Well, that, and that's the thing is that there's the structural element and then there's the habitual element from whatever past experience that if we don't uh, help reprogram the nervous system, the brain to stand in a way that to realize there's a more comfortable way and change the way the load is, you just keep chasing the problem instead of changing it to a better situation. Right, right, exactly. I can make all this magic happen with loading these arches and loading this and trimming that and all these different things based on looking from this perspective. But if the horse is going to insist on standing the same way, whether it's under itself, we call goat on a rock, or whether it's you know habitually with the right hind forward a little bit, it's still loading its foot in the old place. You know, I always appreciated when you would teach us in riding and in body use about, you know, where's your old place and now find the new place. So you could kind of go in and out of those because it gave us a better range of functionality, especially leaving you, right? Right. So the thing my students complain about the most when I make them go back and forth, but it's the most important. (laughs) Yes, that's stuck with me forever. And I do that with my horses. Okay, here's here's your default posture. Okay, but we need to show you a different idea. Yep. How about this idea? And you know, just put them back there, right? And I remember you putting hands on me and going, well, what if you just tried to think about it from this direction? And then I'd be like, (laughs) and then you're like, okay, go back the old way. And it's like, Right. When you get, when you, the students started arguing, that's when I knew the change was really happening. And it's the same yeah. with the horses. When you ask them to go to the old place and they're like, no, no, I don't want to do that anymore. No, no. Yeah. So I often give my owners with these types of collapsed arch problems or collapsed water balloon problems, homework of helping their horse go in and out of those places, you know, a la Wendy Murdoch. And of course, you know, always recommend that they have their short foot pads to facilitate that process of giving the horse the opportunity to experiment with their own proprioception, load, balance, posture, all those things so that they can find a better place of functional stability after we've made a huge hoof change. Right. It changes everything. Right. Yeah, because you've Uh, got you you've got to address the nervous system, whether it's a horse, a dog, a person, you've got to address the nervous system to say, look, oh my goodness, you can do this. (laughs) Okay, tell us about this one. Wow. Okay. So believe it or not, this horse is actually standing under that towel on a short foot pad. She has a um she was unfortunately very um upright and had been knuckling over. And she's one of my case studies in Patreon. So if you're interested in her whole story, I have to now write the follow-up because she ended up 
uh, regressing due to COVID. The barn was closed and nobody could get down there to take care of her feet. So she was knuckling over. So she had tendon surgery and then I rehabbed her and she was standing upright and her hoof capsules were loading normally. So her arches were being taken care of. It was wonderful. And then COVID happened and because she was no longer getting the assertive hoof care and things that she probably really desperately needed. The left one was still fine, but the right one went back and knuckled over again. Wow. So the only intervention that was left was to cut again, unfortunately. And the they opted because of how contracted she was, they opted to cut the superficial and the deep flexor tendon, which is never a good idea because then what's left holding up the leg? The suspensories. Yeah. And the suspensories are not designed to be the main load bearing support. It's only meant as a sling to hold the fetlock in position, right? So now her leg did reposition, but she had a ton of arthritis in this coffin joint. So even though they cut the tendon and she did, she was able to go back on her foot again, this joint never straightened because of the arthritis. And we knew that was a possibility, but she's not a huge pony. So we were like, it's either that or send her to the heavens. We're gonna give her one more opportunity to heal. But you know, none of us had a great thought about her long-term future. Right. So um, what ends up happening with these horses, unfortunately, is the suspensories eventually give way. She had a good bit more happy time, but eventually the suspensories just can't hold the load and their fetlock ends up going almost to the ground, if not to the ground. Yeah. So, you know, so I was asked to get back involved and I saw her now she has a sore here and that's from overloading that heel. It's a pressure sore mm. because when she would walk, her toe would flip up in the air. Mm. So I put her, we, we, this is a day we gave her a bath. She wasn't overly sweaty there. We just gave her a bath because she needed a, a good cleaning, <coughs> excuse me. And so um, the wetness is not stress and sweat. Please don't worry. Um, she was just eating a little bit of, of grass, drying out. You can see the towels all over the place. And I wanted to keep her, her heel clean and dry. We'd also clean tracks this foot and we were gonna rewrap it. And of course, I'm trying to figure out how can I help her best? Because right now we're thinking she's a wonderful little pony with a good quality of life who's actually not metabolic. So laminitis is not a concern in this case. So she can live a nice pasture life moseying around if we can just figure out how to support this leg. Now, traditionally, she would get a nailed on metal shoe with a long heel extension with a welded rod that would have a padded cup. And oh, the wow. Cup would support the fetlock. So if you look, if you search online, and you search for um, suspensory shoeing. Um, when you have suspensory failure, sometimes what they'll do is they will actually build a support for the fetlock. The problem, of course, with that is that the fetlock is not meant as a weight bearing device. Right. So eventually they often get pressure sores on their fetlock. And that's kind of what ends things because you know, live tissue is only live tissue. And yes, it buys them some time. And some of them live that way for a long time, quite happily, but eventually it's a progressive problem. So it, it usually there's a breakdown issue. So where the water balloon analogy and surefoot pads to me work really, really synergistically together. And this is why I was really excited to do this webinar with you, Wendy, because it's, it's like the two things together are like magical to me understanding this idea of arches load the water balloon circulation displacing how's the horse loading and the information that surefoot can give us back right is so valuable what i did is i put her on the surefoot pad and i looked at what in the world was she actually standing on okay and then i'm like okay so if i can build her a support uh, unfortunately i i feel so terrible about it i didn't take a picture of the pad because of course, after she stood on it for a period of time and we took her foot off and removed the towel, it was clear that she was way loading the points of her heel, which is not something to stand on. Right. Right. Like stand on a teeter totter with instability in your joint 
and have an arthritis in the coffin joint and have any opportunity of comfort. Like that, it, it's just not going to work. But what's also interesting is she was collapsing to the inside. And I would not have caught that otherwise, that she was massively overloading the inside heel compared to the outside heel. So she was not only, you know, like this, but then she was also tipped like that. Right. So, um, so then it helped me build this for her. So she loved that short foot pad. And Wendy, what I did is I took, I took two of your medium density hoof pads. Yeah. Okay. And I cut them to a shape that would give her enough support in the toe, but also support the fetlock. So it made it this like oblong, like hot dog shape like this. Right. Yeah. And then I put a second piece of pad and I elasticoned it to the first one and kind of shaved it on a wedge and made it one piece like this. And we wrapped wow. her. This was so much fun. And it was all with, with sure foot pads, which was so cool. So then I wrapped a, um, I put silver sulfadiazine on her heel because that was a pressure sore. It wasn't an abscess. So I put something nice to the tissue there. We put a dry animal index pad on the area just in case it turned into more than just a pressure sore. And because it's soft and what have you. And then we put cotton around it and then vet wrap to give her some protection there. And then I played with this pad and you can see in this photo how the center of mass comes down. Where, where's the water balloon now? You've, you've made a giant water balloon to support the whole thing. Yes, yes. So take that water balloon analogy of load and support and you can do so many creative things to give the horse with an injury and dysfunction like this, give her something that she can stand and walk on. So, you know, we were able to give her her angulation back of her foot. And then I set this thing back this far because clearly she just needed to roll over this thing. Like she didn't need toe support. Right. You know, she, she's a, you know, 500 pound pony. What she needed was just support the back and let her just roll off of it easily. But look at how she would lean on that inside. Yeah. And I, I would not have seen that the whole thing, you know, you, you bend the knee and none of this moves at all. This is all stuck in one place. So there was no changing position. It was more just changing the orientation of that balloon to the ground. Do you have pictures of her? How, how did she move after this? I have a, yeah, I have a video. Oh, cool. I didn't put it in here, but I can share it with you. Um, the unfortunate side of it is that um, she ended up with um, this area breaking down really completely and she went to heaven. Yeah. But, um, but I was able to give her comfort in the short run and she was very functional this way. So let me just airdrop this video onto my computer and I'll play it for us. What an interesting idea. Well, so that's why I included her because I, I wanted you all to be able to see that it's not just about, you know, oh, my horse is a little low in the heel or, oh, you know, my horse um you know chronically abscesses in this part of their foot but it's it's also about taking this idea of support is the most important thing to that animal right the ability to keep their brain stem from having an unceremonious meeting with the ground yeah is the highest priority of the nervous system right 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 so all this pony needed was something to keep her vertical that she could move around on in a stable way without undue discomfort right like She's gonna, she has arthritis. She has a lot of compensatory problems, but she has no serious job. So sound for purpose, right? We just wanted her to be comfortable on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's amazing how it worked way better, especially because of all those wonderful foam products that you've given us that we can do these creative builds and supports of different densities and, you know, really brilliant things, Wendy. Thank you so much for- what Oh, you're you welcome. I'm just, you know, it's so much fun to like see how it's, how things are being used in the creative ways. Cause 
you know, I am not in this field, right? You are, and yet I can give you something and then you can run with it. And that I think is what's so exciting. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me show you here. Let's see. There's her, where's her video? Here it is. Okay, I'm sending this over now. I love technology when it works. Yes. All right, I'm gonna stop my share for a moment. Yep. That's my last slide. So, okay, that's perfect. And then I'm working on two screens here. So now I'm going to uh, go pull up my video that I just sent over. Downloads, it's coming, give it a second. Um, so it's, you know, so it's pretty, pretty cool stuff, really. Well, and that, and that's exactly it. It's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of different materials that are available and the, and then there's a lot of, uh, unusual cases like this. And it's how, how can we marry the technology to the situation to actually do, do something like that is make the animal more comfortable. And that's really, uh, what it's all about. Yes, absolutely. Right. I mean, to give these animals their, their feeling of balance, stability, it, it's such an important thing, especially for a prey animal whose ability for fight or flight is dependent sure. on their survival. Yep. You know? Okay. So here is her walking. Now, so we, we had that, I wrapped all that on with Elasticon so it wouldn't move too much. And right. And we put tape on it so she could walk around in our paddocks without wearing through the whole thing and losing it because that wouldn't have been good. Nope. So. Do you want to drop your sound on the video? Yeah. So she's got a proprioceptive difference between the two feet, right? Like her right one is like walking in a bit of a clown shoe. So she's high stepping with the left one as well, but um, I'll play it again. But yeah. um, what's interesting about it is she's not nearly as dysfunctionally lame as you might expect. And you can see how she lands so hard in that heel. Like oh, she just, yeah comes right down because that's what's under her center of mass. Right. Can you just drag drag it slowly cuz it the video is yeah. breaking up but I think if you drag it it'll it'll um we'll have a better chance of kind of seeing cuz it seems to want to keep going back to the same place. Yeah, good good job. Pull it backwards. Forwards. So watch how she lands here. Yeah, yeah. But then she can break over, but she's picking up that left foot. Really oh, yeah. High. How interesting. She picks it up really high. Because of the proprioceptive difference between the left and the right foot. Yeah. But she's not lame in the sense of like, I can't move. And she's moving pretty well. Yeah. In terms of well, and you can right. see how she, what you know, when that foot comes down, she's really loading onto the water balloon at the back of the foot. That's really what she right. wants. Like her nervous system is saying, there should be something there to support me. And now there yes. is. And now there is. And if we didn't have that there, her fetlock would just go straight to the ground and the toe would flip up off the, off the ground. Right. Because there should be not super short legged, right? It would act like a really short leg. And think about how, if the foot holds the water balloon, her water balloon is in the next county. Yeah. Right. So it's all pushed to the front and it's completely dysfunctional and it's not doing its job at all. So we built her a prosthetic one. Yeah. No, very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. I thought you'd like that. Yeah. I thought you'd like that. So, you know, that to me is, is water balloon analogy in a nutshell. Um, you know, just this idea that when you think about the foot and you think about the problems you're having, don't just think about it from the looking at the soul side and what do you need to work on here to fix the problem it's almost to me in my way of conceptualizing hoof care it's almost more important to think about it from the top down and how is the horse loading those four arches and if you can even out the water balloon load so the four arches are all supported really well you're going to have better blood supply to the entire foot so everything else you're doing to support a healthy foot can be more effective over time. Yep. Cool. That's really cool. And it's just, like I said, it suddenly dawned on me when I thought about like 
uh, air pads and things under saddles and how the, the load actually keeps forcing everything out of the way and therefore keeps the situation stuck. You can't, you've got to do something to really reorganize it because it's not going to come back on its own unless you actually do something to look at it from that perspective. So that's super cool. That really makes a lot of sense to me. Unless you have a horse with a really symmetrical back and a really well-built saddle and a really symmetrically balanced rider, like the ideal foot, well, then maybe you'd be okay. Yeah, exactly. But that's, not, that's not reality, right? right? Reality is, is that those things, especially in motion, right, don't usually equal zero, right? You know, equal equal neutral. So, especially as motion changes and directions change, there's that, you know, kind of everything has to support itself underneath itself, and dynamically, that's not realistic in that model. Right. No, but the other thing it makes me think of too is that by having these arches, it does allow the foot to be able to adapt to all these different surfaces. Because when you look at what horses walk over and like I train my horses out in a field on a hill, you know, that, that surface is constantly different every step. And yet they're able to accommodate that, which is, I find so amazing. Yes. And, you know, I, I listened to um, Dr. Hillary Clayton. Do you know yeah. Dr. Clayton? Oh, yeah, I know her well. Yeah. So you know, she presented at one of our hoof conferences uh, one year and the two points that she made to us were so impactful to me just from her expertise in kinematics and biomechanics, validating kind of some of the ways that I was thinking about this in a layperson way about first, she said that if the ground reaction force, so if the force from the ground does not go through the center of rotation of the joint, any joint, meaning it's not equally loaded in load, the soft tissue around the joint has to oppose the additional torque. Oh, sure. So break down an injury, right? So yeah. if you're not loaded in an appropriate way, like all of our racehorses that gallop and then their standing leg is not perpendicular because their gait timing is off for whatever reason, feet, teeth, compensation, body growing, whatever, then if their limb is not loaded square at single load weight bearing on one limb, they're going to have stress on all the other structures is what right. she's saying, there, right? And then the other one that she, she said that really hit home was that the, the DIP joint, so the distal interphalangeal joint, which is the coffin joint, where we put the center for the arches and everything pivots around, that the main job of the DIP joint is to, to accommodate irregularities in terrain or farrier, but not day after day, step after step. Right. So where that goes for me is that if you already have a water balloon that's unevenly loaded and you've got displacement of mass one direction or another, even standing at rest neutral, your your coffin joint is asymmetrically loaded and there's wear and tear in one direction or another just at rest, let right. alone then when you add athletic activity and you add athletic activity over a variety of terrain without an, une without an even water balloon, you're setting that horse up for long-term problems. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Interesting. I love how the connections all come around, right? The yeah, it's really great. Well, yeah, Daisy, this has been really fascinating. I'm so glad you came and talked to us about the water balloon analogy because it just suddenly just clicked. And this whole idea of the arches and the support makes so much more sense to me now. So I really appreciate your time. It's really great to see you. Good. I was really thanks, happy. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. Just remember you can find this in all the other webinars and Daisy's playlist on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. When anybody's done more than three webinars, they always get a playlist and I know she has one. So you can go and see all of her other webinars and um, it's great. It's so good to see you. Thanks for tuning in everybody and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Thanks Wendy. Bye, Bye. everybody.